Hello everyone, I'm Andrew Vermesh and this is the third of eight short sessions to help you with various aspects of problem solving. This is module three, the value of knowing cause. So a few words from me. Um, Katie has been working on problem solving for 62 years and I've been doing this for about 25 years. And this session is about finding cause. We may find that the slides advance a bit more slowly than I would like, and I'm seeing that on screen now, so we'll pause for just a moment to let the system catch up. If you can't hear, do remember to click to unmute, uh, and if you have any other problems, there is a help function that you can use with Bright Talk. So there are eight webinars for this month. You'll see that session five is also about course. It's worth looking at both of these either live or later on. Please sign up for whichever sessions you like the look of and share them with your friends and colleagues. Now let's get on to the meat for, for today. This is module three, why do we want to find cause? Well, often we don't. One of the key complaints of customers, users, and top management is that technical experts spend too long arguing about the cause and delay the point where the system or process is up and running again. An example, the Citrix issue. So thousands of users at a well-known financial services company were experiencing issues logging in or being kicked out of their work session on their computer. During the investigation, we noticed that some users had different group policy objects applied, never mind if that's all uh, Latin or Greek to you. This was escalated to the vendor to explain why or how the group policy objects could have changed and some days passed without an answer. In the end, we cut the, and paste the group policy objects from unaffected users to the affected ones, and the incident stopped. So the point here is you only need to investigate to the extent that you find a workable and a decent solution. Now there may be a value in going further. Let's try to work on that. But before we do, I'm gonna ask you a question in a vote. So how often do you need to find cause? Please start voting now. How often do you need to find cause in your organization? Just three options for this one. Hundred percent for we cannot handle most of our problems without knowing cause. So far, that's incredibly hard. Oh, now it's balancing out a bit now. Thirty-eight percent for half of the time, and fourteen percent for hand. Oh, now workarounds are are coming up on the rails. Interesting. Now your view of workarounds could be a little bit like the one you see on screen now. Whenever you have a problem, there's a cause, whatever the cause is, and there's an effect on the business or process or quality or whatever it affects. Now we can take action in one of two ways. It can be corrective, in other words, remove or modify the cause so that the problem no longer exists, or against the effect or symptom. And we call those two things corrective or adaptive depending on which action we're going to take. And going back to the example about workarounds, you know, when we're driving a car on the way to work, maybe we're leaving lockdown now and we're going to the office again and we have a flat tire, do we need to know the cause of the flat tire? Clearly not. We change the spare and we move on. So there are many situations in life and work where you can take a meaningful and useful action to get you moving 
without knowing the cause. Now, of course, if you have a flat tyre on the same road, on the same part of the same road, three days in a row, now you're going to be wanting to look for cause. So the need for cause is often very contextual. So why would we want to find cause? Well, it's here in the text. If the best way of containing the effect is to remove the cause. Now, we often do workarounds. We've all seen our electronic devices slow down or become unruly from time to time. We happily reboot them as long as the disruption involves in small and the need to do it is infrequent, then we stick with this workaround. We all know it's not going to solve the problem, but the effort in calling the help desk and raising a ticket and answering a bunch of seemingly irrelevant questions may be too much. And I've worked with major companies that restart their core databases every couple of weeks, late at night on a Saturday or whatever, because that's less trouble than finding the cause. So often the cost of investigation is huge and full of effort and we're short of the subject matter experts we need to do it and we will go for a workaround. And the judgment you make is really up to you as a, an expert in the process or system to do that. Now, there is a good reason for finding cause other than this being the best way of stopping or containing the effect, which is choice. It's down to choice. The best way of dealing with something may well be the fixing the cause or it may be a workaround, but if you don't know the cause, you don't know whether it's the fix or the workaround. So finding a really elegant solution is an important thing to do. Your choice. You think about what way works best for you in each problem. Now, there are a lot of workarounds that get done, and you may well have suffered some of those. And one of the topics for today is woeful workarounds, and I've got a couple of examples of those coming up now. This one on the screen, hopefully, for all of you. Sometimes the effort involved does become rather ridiculous. We make an adaptive fix. In this case, the bridge is gone. In the diagram, when it finally comes up, it hasn't for me yet, but it probably will sooner or later. And that's fine. And then we see another issue, and we add another workaround, and then another, and we see another workaround. Let's just go backwards and forwards and see if that fixes the problem. Yep, there it is. When the effort involved becomes ridiculous in this, as it does in this picture, working around not having a bridge across the gorge is a bit of a nuisance. And I'm sure you've got things like that in your life. Got another one example from technology here coming up next. Something real that I've seen happen not very long ago. So the asset database gets corrupted. So what do we do? We reload the database from the backups. Now, unfortunately, automated backups do fail occasionally. So what do we do? We manually check backups and we re rerun. But occasionally the disk array itself becomes corrupted. So we replace the disks and rerun the backups. But one day, the duty manager's off sick. And so, no one actually reruns the backups when they fail and we lose the asset data. So sometimes we put so many manual steps in to work around things that we end up with a mess. Now, you know this is true because quite often you will find that reporting of one sort or another is not to your liking or your taste in your corporate system. What do you do? You have a workaround. It's called Excel. And before you know it, Excel worksheets have proliferated all over your organization and you've had no idea how many different versions of the financial truth there are. So we have to watch it with workarounds. Some of them are not good in the, in the beginning and some of them are certainly not durable. Now, let's talk about what do we want to do if we are interested in cause. And the first thing to say about looking for cause is don't, at least not first, not your first activity. Now the why question often causes more trouble than it's worth in problem solving. The true path to cause always lies in the data and that's where we need to begin. 
Now, if you think about the reason why this is true, so if we ask people a why question, they will often come up with a reason. We don't know whether that's true or not at that point until we have the data. If we ask them to draw a fishbone diagram, they will come up with suggestions in the fishbone diagram, which are not the real cause, but are laden with some assumptions. So one of the things that can happen is that if you focus at the beginning on possible causes, it can lead to a lot of misdirected effort. So let's have a look at something else that will really help you in this area. If we're looking for data, we have to make sure that the data is clean, clear, and valid. So important data points for all of you who are KT alumni will be about timing, will be about location, will be about the symptoms themselves. And the important thing to do in this context is to make sure that we separate data from ideas. Look, as humans, we love stories. They help us to put information into context and make us feel comfortable. The danger to problem solvers is that our colleagues frequently mix hard data with their ideas about that data. They tell us the story of what they think happened with some pieces of data mixed in, and sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference. So, rule one, anything not certain must be declared as such. So one of the things you can do with people is to say, well, let's have a look at what we know for sure that you are willing to sacrifice your next quarter's salary if this is not accurate. There's a test for accuracy. Then look for data that you might want, and then separately, ideas about that data. Switches had the software upgrade last night. We don't know whether that upgrade was run successfully or not yet. And that may have something to do with the cause. It may not have something to do with the cause. Switches on that circuit are old. Again, people are suggesting that may be a possible cause. That's fine, just so long as we separate data that we know for sure from ideas. Let's look at how we do that. Here is a check for facts. You might like the cartoon, you might not. I like it. I'm really wedded to Dilbert for some of these examples. So facts will have a reliable source that you can reference. It'll be a log file, it'll be a console, it'll be a screenshot, it'll be a picture, and those facts will tend to be precise. There'll be some data from your quality management system, there'll be some data from your monitoring systems. So facts will have that kind of thing around them. And if in doubt, check what is the source. Opinions, on the other hand, will tend to have qualifying words like might, could, probably think, and will probably lack source detail. And the danger to you is they may be presented as facts. So let's have a little practice here. If you go into the attachments, you'll see a little transcript of a, an incident with some systems. And if you'd like to click that, open that up, and just quickly identify each contribution as either a fact or an opinion. And you don't have to be absolutely right about this, but I'd be interested to see what you identify as fact or opinion as you do that. Oh, there's a nice, nice point. Interesting that in climate change talks, we call corrective actions mitigation. Well, clearly somebody's mixing things up. So whoever's doing that kind of climate change work um, might want to come to a KT class and learn about how to do problem solving properly. Ooh, that was harsh, wasn't it? Let's just have your notes in the title of the document for people. So the attachment you're looking for is the module three case, if you haven't found it yet. So you've got a conversation between user and the support desk. And if you look at those, try and identify what you think is factual and what you think is an idea. Uh, 
uh, we're running slightly over our allotted time, but it doesn't matter, we can keep going for a little bit longer. Those of you who haven't got there yet, if you look at the second piece of transcript from the support desk, there's something there I'd like you to classify as factual or idea. The problem is with the MySQL database. Do you think that's fact or idea? Oh yeah, so there's loads of facts there. Well done. Fact three, yeah, well done. What do you think about the MySQL? Fact error messages page not displayed, good. What do you think about the problem is with MySQL database? Fact or idea? Opinion I hear from one of my colleagues that uh, there may be some inefficient code which needs to be corrected. Good. Let's stop that at this point because we're running to the point where we've got less than two minutes left. So moving forward here, got something for you to try based on that transcript actually. So we're all in Teams meetings or Zoom meetings or WebExes or whatever at the moment, and we're meeting lots of colleagues concerning lots of problems. So, you have a book chapter about problem solving, if you like it, but, um, please let me know. But what I'd like you to do is record a short clip from a problem solving meeting using Team or Zooms or whatever. Just do it for five minutes. That's another good fact, well done. Um, press record for about five minutes, do ask first. Then play back your recording after the meeting and identify how many factual data points you hear and how many ideas or assumptions. What conclusions can you draw from that? That'd be an interesting thing to hear your feedback about. And it doesn't matter, you know, it's okay. It's completely okay, but we do need to be aware of which is which if we're gonna make progress in problem solving. So we're back on Thursday. That's the end of this talk. We're back on Thursday at 1.15. Thursday's a slight change of pace. We're looking at priority conflicts in module four. It'll be module five that pushes the whole business of finding cause a bit further. Look forward to seeing you on that. And if you want to get in touch with me, find me at, at Bernash Andrew on Twitter or in LinkedIn. And it'd be lovely to hear from you how you're getting on with this particular task. Thanks ever so much for attending and bye-bye for now.